Welcome to Between Two Shades, Uncovering the Gray Optic. My name is Cleve Clark, and I am your host and producer of today's show. We have today with us Rachel Dolasol, and she has been involved in, in a lot of different activities that promote the understanding of these social issues that we're talking about through the gray optic. I'd like to introduce Rachel to the program, and Rachel, welcome to the program, Between Two Shades. How are you? Thank you so much for having me, Glee. Great to have you here on our show, and we're looking forward to a very productive discussion with you. So, when we talk about race, you know, this is a topic that sometimes becomes very nebulous and so forth, and some people are trying to wrap their arms around this concept of race, and they really don't know. How does that pertain to your understanding of the race worldwide? So I think that there's a lot of confusion just due to lack of education um, over the, the term race, because a lot of times race, culture, and ethnicity get conflated yeah. and kind of become like one um, entity or one definition, and people just are not aware of the differences between those three mm -hmm. um, terms, you know, historically, but also uh, in terms of social constructs and lived experience and, and the way that society has interacted with uh, groups of people. Race uh, really is a, is a relatively new term or a worldview about a hierarchy, which is the hierarchy of white supremacy, which I don't subscribe to. So I don't, I don't believe in the race worldview. I believe that we are all human beings. We belong to the human race. When it comes to separate races, the human race doesn't meet the zoological qualifications for separate races, as Dorothy Roberts has mentioned in her book, Fatal Invention. And so it's kind of like human beings have been, you know, we're about 200,000 years old as a, as a race. At Homo sapiens, and um, just in the last 500 years, has this idea of race been initiated, introduced, and then acted upon for the purposes of oppression? Mm. So that tiny little sliver in human history, the last 500 years, has really uh, shaped our ideas of this word um, and kind of erased that. 199,500 years mm -hmm. <laughs> of human history beforehand. So it's really only one four hundredth of human history that we're so obsessed with when it comes to the idea of race. And when I say it's um, really the idea of white supremacy, because mm -hmm. race was, was instituted in order to create hierarchies of groups of people that combine behavioral characteristics, value, and uh, worth with uh, physical features. And that view, you know, again, 500 years old, it's time to get rid of it in my view. Yeah, it's a social construct. And it's designed Correct. to subjugate certain people. You're absolutely right. right, and that's a great insight about it. Uh, what was your experience like standing in front of the front lines of social justice as an advocate? and a voice for the victims. So nothing really made my heart sing more than fighting for social justice, and mm -hmm. it still does. But standing in the front lines, um, you know, I've been more back in the shadows in the last seven years, just kind of pushed more to the sidelines. But being in the front lines was um, something that brought me a lot of joy because I was able to organize a lot of momentum, specifically with the youth. And, my focus was on the five game changer issues, which um, it, as defined by the NAACP and other social justice organizations really address economic justice, as well as health and healthcare justice, criminal justice and public safety, um, political representation, as well as educational uh, equity and justice. And so those five justice issues were really uh, my passion still are my passion, mm -hmm. and it was um, amazing to see measurable change. I think my advocacy work is always focused on what can you prove has changed uh, as a result of your activism. And so um, getting that data in provides more fuel for the work to continue. 
Fantastic, fantastic. You know, it's inspiring to know that you had that passion for a long time. And, you know, it's hopeful that more people will have the same level of enthusiasm to be able to, you know, do the same kind of work and make the same kind of contribution to eradicate racism and, race, and racial supremacy theories. Because that's all they are, really, is a theory. Right. So I'm really glad that, you know, it's, it's, there are certain people that have a desire to do this kind of work and they're unique in their own way, and I see you as being one of those people. So I'm really glad that you are really, you know, fighting for racial justice across all groups and so forth, and that's wonderful. Did you know this at an early age that you were going to want to do this type of work, or I mean, when did it become clear to you that this was the kind of work you were, you know, you were supposed to do? You know, so I think at a very early age. Um, I experienced a lot of pain in, in terms of being raised in an abusive household. And so I always knew that I wanted to protect other people from pain mm -hmm. and to fight for um, the underdog, if it will, um, just anybody who is in a marginalized situation, whether that be due to gender, um, whether that be to culture, race, ethnicity, um, you know, just in disability. Any, anyone who is in a situation where they are being oppressed um, and suffering, I think my heart goes out and my heart is, is definitely always wanting to, you know, <laughs> alleviate as much suffering as possible. And it's not just because I'm, you know, some do-gooder, but it's because I've also suffered. And I think anyone who's experienced pain really wants to show up for others who might be experiencing that. Um, and to prevent it if possible. Mm -hmm.